Ian Burns, welcome to the Paul Fate Podcast. This is the Pod Cave. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great having you on. I appreciate it. I uh, came across your comic, uh, Huge Hannah, at which can be found at hugehanna.com. Hannah is spelled H-A-N-A dot com. Correct. Um, and uh, first thing that drew me to it was the artwork. I love the artwork. Thank and you. And uh, and then the story is interesting. I don't want to give it away, but the, the girl goes off into the uh, ocean, and then uh, there's a comet of some sort. Yeah. And bam. And then and then I don't know if it's her like dreaming or if she, her imagination or if her will turns her into a giant or can we go that far? Oh yeah, I mean it's in the title, so. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, <laughs> she's a giant. Um, yeah. So can you tell me more about it? I mean that's my brief take of it yeah so uh like you said like this kind of bizarre natural disaster kind of causes her to start transforming but at the beginning we're not really sure if it is in her imagination or it's not because every time uh she appears to have some kind of transformation she wakes up like an hour later or a day later unconscious kind of not really remembering what was real and what's not um and as the story progresses um we kind of find out that she's not the only uh, thing on this planet that's being affected by uh, this meteor that's hit Earth and that um, things are starting to kind of come to a boil where she's starting to realize that um, she might be permanently uh, staying in a much larger state and that there might be some things that are not nearly as friendly or as compassionate as her that are also going to be uh, big and nasty. Um, and that's kind of where the comic's going, which is, you know, eventually... Right now she's sort of on the run because she's this giant, powerful, misunderstood person, uh, and everyone's seemingly terrified of her. But um, she's going to need to come to terms with all that and realize when some of these other big, nasty things start showing up that she's really the only one who can do something about it. Um, but, uh, you know... The road has been laid, but we're still, that's still, still all. So you're saying it's still early on. You're in chapter two, probably page yeah. 38, something like that. Yeah, I've only been doing it for a little more than a year. Uh, typically one week at a time. There's always one page every week. Um, and so I think I'm technically only like 60 or 70, somewhere between 60 or 70 pages in. Uh-huh. Uh which immediately when I say that out loud, I'm like, wow, that seems like a lot. But yeah, we're still very much in the origin story era. And there's a lot going on, but uh, there's way, 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 way more stuff to come that is going to kind of, that's going to be radically different from kind of the state of what the comic is now. So it's oh. pretty exciting when n- me knowing what's coming, it's really exciting because. Uh, you can't wait to draw it. I can't wait. And like, <laughs> It took a long time to get to uh, drawing the stuff that's going on now, which is a lot more of the like giant woman chaos action kind of adventure stuff. Um, and now that I'm like doing that, it's like it's super exciting. But I know that you know a month, two months down the road, it's like ten times that. And so, yeah, I'm pretty excited. Great, uh, and you wrote it, and you're illustrating it. Yep. The, it's I pretty much I do oh not pretty much I do everything uh, so um, uh, now can I sh- I hope you don't mind me pointing out that well you know that it goes from black and white to color yeah um, and is that part of that's not part of the story is it no but the funny thing is someone point a couple people have pointed out to me that it almost creates it almost matches the progression of hannah's character in the story but that's all complete coincidence it was black and white originally uh simply because uh a i didn't feel confident in uh my coloring abilities and b i had a limited amount of time to produce a page every week and uh only through stuff like um 
the Patreon campaign and me drawing every week and feeling more and more confident in my style and pushing myself further and further, I've naturally kind of <clears throat> progressed to where I am now. But uh, I, I yeah, think, none of I it was an got, artist. I, here's something I've noticed. Uh, I think you've got quite a substantial, 70 pages is pretty substantial, a lot of artwork that you've done on this project. Um, you, you know, um, I don't know how how much is going to be in the end, like if it's going to be a graphic novel or is it just a, an ongoing story. But I noticed something about like, other projects like this. A lot of times they'll start off with one, like the quality of the drawing is A, and then the, the artist improves as they go along. I thought yours is top-notch right from the beginning. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's really... Um, yeah, I, I'm. It's really nice that you say that, but like, I did not feel that way when I started. Like, I ne like the last time I had drawn a comic before working on Huge Hanna, I was probably maybe like I was some. I was at some point during my teens where I was like drawing it. So it had been a long time where I'd sat down and really been like, I'm going to draw a comic, and so just throwing myself into it by just creating the website, per putting the first few pages online, it just forced myself to kind of deal with what may have been my insecurities as an artist. And I feel like I've overcome a lot of that stuff, but uh, I still I still now, from week to week to week, still see improvements. Like, I'm always, there's always something I kind of learn with each page, um, which means each page is also a major challenge. There's always something about it that's really challenging, but... Uh, yeah, it's it makes me excited to, to to think where it could what it could look like, you know, even six what, months from now. Now, is it, do you intend to be a self-contained like graphic novel or? That's always an... yeah. The, the to me, uh, a, having a physical book has always been my number one objective, and really by ha by the it's. It's not so much a web comic as it is a work in progress that I'm letting everyone watch unfold. And so right. people can watch the comic grow and change and evolve um, so that by the time we get to a book, uh, maybe people can appreciate, you know, seeing a little bit behind the curtain, seeing the evolution of this thing. Um, definitely. That's yeah, what so I did. I did that on two books. And but Yeah, like it's it it just to me it makes the most sense where it's just like, you know, as transparent as I can be, like hopefully it'll inspire somebody else and it also allows me to get a lot more constructive criticism from an audience before I, you know, put a whole book together in secrecy, <laughs> put it out there. Like now it's like I really get to understand how people react to it ahead of time, which has been really beneficial. So do you have an idea of how many pages it'll be in the end? The, I, I see it being multiple volumes, and the first volume is going to be somewhere between 125 and 150 pages. So the first when I put out my first book, it's going to be a big, fat book. Uh -huh. uh, and That's... then pro probably every volume after that will be somewhere between 60 to 80 pages. And they'll be released probably on a uh, maybe a six-month period. So six months to make the book and then put it out, six months to make another book, put it out. That'd be kind of like my ideal thing. Okay. That's that's pretty ambitious. Yeah. And so, you know, it, right now it all seems doable, but who knows what will happen. But uh, Kids, uh, it's... Um, I notice like a lot of... Uh, kickstarters you know like I, okay i want to work on this book but you know i need i need this much i, I notice you have a patron um page which i really dig those i i patronize a few different artists that i really admire but the kickstarter ones i've i part participated in those as well as far as donating but um have you had a kickstarter or anything like that I haven't had a Kickstarter, um, and the only reason for that is because uh, I don't really... My, my plan for this is to produce the first book completely on my own as far as funding it, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. along with anyone who's willing to help me out with the Patreon. Um, and the great thing about Patreon, which you know, is that unlike a Kickstarter, it's ongoing. 
So right. it really it really helps carry me through the development of the first book. My plan is that once I've got that first book complete, uh, I would like to basically kickstart um, the printing process of each uh, uh, subsequent book that follows it. Okay. Um, so that's kind of the plan right now is to get a really so basically I don't I don't feel confident going to Kickstarter until I have almost an entirely complete book of artwork oh, done okay. that I can go look at all this artwork now let's just help me print this thing right right oh that's admirable can you tell us a little bit about your history and uh, and uh, how'd you get into comics or what do you you know how'd you get to be so good at drawing. <laughs> Uh, I've writing. always been drawing before. I think I've been drawing, as far as any creative stuff I've done, I've been drawing more and longer than anything else. But uh, when I was in my early, I would say pr like probably around like 12 or 13, I, uh, I really decided I wanted to be a filmmaker. Uh, and so I went to school for filmmaking, and I still I have a company now which I do uh, all kinds of stuff with. Um, which pretty much pays my bills. And uh, the thing is, when you're doing that kind of work, like I do a lot of freelance work, a lot of documentary work. Uh, I, like, you know, you try to make short films in between that stuff, but, mm -hmm. the, but the, the amount of output is not nearly as immediate because filmmaking is such a massive undertaking, even on a, sm even, uh, on a small thing, just the amount of time it takes to put anything together. Uh -huh. So... Basically, Huge Hannah came about because uh, I had been drawing. I had never stopped drawing, and I had worked for a toy company for a while as a freelance illustrator. So drawing was always a part of what I do. And even in filmmaking, you're always drawing because you're storyboarding and you're designing all kinds of stuff. And it just dawned on me that some of the stories that I've always been wanting to tell, that I've been kind of trying to work my way to doing it, there's no reason why I can't just figure out a way to tell some of these stories with some of my other talents other than filmmaking. And Huge Hannah was one of those things. Once I kind of, I always had this really basic idea for it, which was just like giant woman fighting giant monsters. And yeah. then, but once I kind of realized this would work better as a comic than anything else, then really the whole nature of the story because now I knew it was going to be a comic, it just kind of like unfolded. And now I can only imagine it being a comic. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like I, I think I'm kind of like a, you know, a, a mixed bag of, uh, of stuff because I, any given week I'm like tomorrow I'm shooting a documentary for, uh, for a health foundation. Um, but then later that night I'll be drawing huge Hannah. So like my days are kind of a, back and forth between my two biggest interests, which is, you know, film and comics. And it's funny how much the two play off each other. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's I've always just been my entire life jumping back and forth between trying, like, one week I really think I'm going to be a comics artist, and the next <laughs> week I really think I'm going to be a filmmaker. And then suddenly I just realized, well, as long as I figure out a way to not, you know, lose a ton of money... I can probably just figure out how to do both, and that's for the last couple of years. That's what I've been doing. It's been going pretty well so far. Wow, fantastic! Have you made a um, any like fiction films? I made I uh, I made one in film school that was kind of like when you get to the end of your four years, um, you have like a big you have your big class, and then everyone in the class pitches a film, and then they pick like ten out of the twenty students. And they get to direct those films. And then the rest of the class is the crew for, for those films. Uh -huh. um, and so I made a film uh, during that year, which was probably the most substantial fictional film I've made. Um, and now I look at it and I'm just like, oh, God, like, this is crap. Like, I just feel, <laughs> so, like, I just, I feel so distant from it now. Um, but since then, uh, I started working on a, a really ambitious short film that mixes live action stuff with like 2d hand-drawn animation uh -huh. um and i started that about a year ago and now i pretty much work on it once every 
few months when I have time to shoot more stuff for or time to edit more stuff for. So that's been like a passion project long in the making that I really hope to finish uh, in the next at all. It would be amazing if I could finish in the next six months, but at least in the next year. Um, and it's called uh, We Seem Like Giants, and it's, uh, it's basically about a boy who uh, he spends his time in the woods running around with this uh, little dinosaur that may or may not exist in his imagination. But the dinosaur is all done through 2D animation based on the drawings that this kid is always drawing in his notebook. So at some point, his kind of notebook comes to life, and he yeah, kind of escapes from the tumultuous, you know, uh, collapse of his parents' relationship by kind of delving into his imagination with this dinosaur. But it's a lot of work. So basically you shoot a bunch of stuff and then you pretty much have to figure out, okay, how do we insert this 2D animated dinosaur into this? It's, it's a lot of work. What, do you, uh, uh, what kind of tools do you use for your um, animation? So a lot of the animation I hope to have done by a much more professional illustrator than I am, but I roughly, I do a lot of like keyframes and rough storyboards and stuff just in Photoshop. Uh, okay. So I'll bring in like a frame from the film and just kind of draw over it kind of roughly what it is. And then the, the plan is to just hand all that stuff off to an animator when I have all of it ready and they can just take that and run with it. I gotcha. I see. Okay. So you're just doing the live action stuff yourself yeah because okay. the, the problem is right now is that I'm, i've been working with this the the actor that plays the the kid like um you know every month that goes by he gets older and yeah uh, <laughs> and i'm not trying to do a boyhood thing where it kind of goes through like you know his entire life so there is a little bit of like pressure on me to to finish the thing right. so i heard but, about uh, game, some guys were talking about game of thrones today and and I guess the actors that play like the little kids now are, you know, like dramatically grown. older. Yeah. 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 So you know they're just going to cut them out of the story or something. <laughs> but, so yeah, you better get your get your live action stuff shot <laughs> before the kid goes through a growth spurt. That's my hope. And he's right at that age where like at any, like any day now <laughs> he's going to just wake up and have like a beard. Right. So it's like but my thirteen year old did that. He I swear in the last year he grew a, a foot. He's got a now he shaves, so yeah, no, it's it's almost alert, over. Now. Alert, alert, hurry! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow, that is really crazy. I mean, you're uh, you've got a lot of irons in the fire, irons in the fire. I guess is what they call that. But a lot of yeah. creative different or different creative things to keep your. Um, That's actually what keeps me interested in all of them because I feel like if I focus on any one thing for too long, I either fall out of love with it or I get maybe kind of anxious about it. And it, and it really helps to just at the moment you're starting to get a little overwhelmed by one project or you're maybe starting to get feel like it's becoming a little bit of a grind and you're, or you're frustrated with it by switching to something else because you have to because – the next day you're doing this for a job or that for a job. It, it really helps when you come back to what those other projects are. You've kind of got this like reinvigorated sense instead of really just staring at something day in, day out. And just like right. when I was working for the toy company, that's what started to happen was I was just you, the nature of the company was you basically work on like four products um, for about six to eight months and uh you see it through the entire step of production and this and this company it was a lot of craft based toys so you weren't working on things that were i think if i was working on something that was more physical it'd probably more exciting because you can literally see it coming together in front of you but uh -huh. it was really just a lot of sitting in front of a computer drawing something pitching it it goes nowhere, and there was just so much back and forth, so much back and forth that it, it really started. I just really fell out of love with it. Um, uh -huh. that, was probably, that would was that like a dream job when you first got it? I mean, it sounds like fun, well, you know. The funny thing is, like, so I go to I go to university for film, and then the first job I get within weeks out of graduating is a toy designer job. So it was literally like the most complete, like sharp turn in the in an opposite direction than what i thought but because when i started working for them 
Uh, it involved graphic design, which is a passion of mine. It involved mm -hmm. illustration. It was like, okay, well, the, my three interests, film, illustration, and graphic design, this job covers at least two of them. Right. Um, so yeah, it, it was, for the first... For the first six months, it was amazing, um, and it was a massive learning experience, which is always exciting. Uh, but then it really just started to become super repetitive, and you kind of aren't really producing a lot of stuff because the production of things takes so long, um, which I know is similar to making a film, but with a film... Every day you're shooting something different, or you're you're working, or you're editing one day, and then you know a week later you're working on the sound. So that development process is always a lot more interesting. When you're just sitting on a computer, and for like you know two months you are just working with uh, you know uh, laboratories and factories in China, and you're trying to source you know a really, a really cheap like plastic straw or some uh some popsicle <laughs> sticks and you're like it should be yeah. really easy to find these things and you've got all these people in different countries saying well we're still looking for this stuff so it all comes in under budget it just started to drive me nuts because <laughs> uh, the fun part the artwork was at the very end of this six month process and by the time um, you got there you the whole time you're trying to get there you're like oh i just can't wait to start drawing this stuff and putting the artwork on the product and then when you get there you're so exhausted so you're just like, oh, whatever, I'll just get this done. <laughs> yeah, it just really started to it started to really wear down on me. And it was such a time consuming job, I wasn't able to do any kind of passion projects outside of work. And right. so I just So it was, it was more like a nine to five job? It was it it was well, it was like a nine to nine job. Like okay. it was But it now was an, you're more you do like projects or freelance now I'm completely independent. Um, I have a film company that I run with two others, and that's all mainly freelance work. Um, and it's like a variety of stuff. So like commercials, documentaries, all kinds of stuff. Um, and we've been doing that for about two years, and that's going really well. And, I, mean, and by I, think that, it's, I think it's a rare, you must have a lot of discipline to be able to do, to run a, business and do creative projects um you know because a lot of creative people i know myself i'm in my younger day i did freelance artwork and i was unreliable <laughs> at best you know um i don't know if oh yeah I, mean, I, I still go through that stuff where you know there's times where my management skills are just terrible but i think right. because of filmmaking like the role of a director like you are you constantly are switching between being a boss and a manager and being an artist and I think right. that's kind of organically seeped its way into allowing me to kind of manage other projects but I still think I'm like the worst one when it comes to to managing stuff like huh. so sometimes it's kind of a miracle when things get done on time and things go according to schedule and stuff well you've been doing it for a couple of years and you're, you're probably better at it than you think I hope so there we go. I see it. All right. You should see a giant picture of Hannah's face, right? Correct. All right. Cool. Oh, this is actually your pa Patreon page. So let me go, I think. A shameless, easy plug for the patron camp. No, I, I love that. Uh, I'm a patron of two people. Um, Keith Knight, who's a car cartoonist. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. No. What's he do? Uh, just sort of like um, gag, or not gag strips, not even, it's, um, he's, he's sort of political, uh, kind of, I don't know, he's, he's out there, but. Like an editorial kind of yes, illustration? Yes, yes. Cool. Um, so, um, there's Keith Knight and then Jim Luhan, who's a independent animator and a real creative guy. Um, he's got a bunch of short films on YouTube. Jim Luhan animation. Um, so I'm a, a lot. pardon. There's a lot of animators on on Patreon. It's pretty amazing. Like it seems like a perfect platform for people who are doing like serial based projects or like 
consi- like it just seems like 90% of the most heavily funded stuff on Patreon is animation, which is really awesome because they really haven't had like a good platform for independent animators ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I love being able to support those um, because especially Keith, who was, he was in papers quite a bit and then that kind of is dying out, I think. Unfortunately. And, yeah. So um, anyway, that's besides the point. So these are great drawings. I love the drawings. The story, um, look at this. This is just awesome to me. Um, there was one character I thought looked like Sean Connery, this guy. Yes, he's very, he has a <laughs> Sean Connery aspect to him. <laughs> um, and then, uh, you know, I, I hate to point this out as it like a, a bad thing because it's not um it goes from black and white to color here and i i love the the muted colors and uh and the way you draw these characters and stuff it's just i get into this kind of thing i'm a big fan so i'm not a, i'm a comics fan but i'm a comics i like comics like this not like uh superman or i love batman but this is just beautiful to me Thanks. Um, the way that you can illustrate and tell a story with these sequential art, um, very well done. So yeah, I feel like that's like part of my filmmaking brain rubbing off on on comics is that I always think of things like shot by shot by shot, probably a little more than, which almost is a restricting thing, but I think it kind of keeps a consistent look amongst the comic at least. Yeah. So this isn't uh, set in Halifax. No, it is not. <laughs> okay. And it's funny because I've gotten people on Twitter uh, who have been like, "You of all people had an opportunity to to set a comic in Halifax that's actually would be actually decent." And it's just like, you know, they're almost like mad about it, and it's just like, "Well, yeah, sorry, I didn't do that." So like, I'll <laughs> blow. Like, trust me. At some point down the road, I'll blow Halifax up in this comic. Don't worry. <laughs> Halifax will show up. It's probably just not going to be in the light that everyone wants it to be. <laughs> and every other reader of the comic will be like, where is Halifax? Like, that sounds fake. <laughs> uh, oh, wow. Yeah, this is cool. Anytime uh, a little gore in there. And it's very professionally done, you know, for somebody to write and then illustrate this professionally I think is rare so I don't even know how I came across this but I just sort of browse from time to time and the artwork just caught my eye and uh, so and then you were kind enough to come on so I yeah, really appreciate absolutely. it Ian no for sure I mean uh, any time to just like chat about process or art or anything like is a blast for me yeah um, I could talk to you all night about this but it's, I try to keep it to um, under 30 minutes. <laughs> so I have a little bit at the end of my show, which, oddly enough, is you're stranded on a deserted island. And you are actually on an island, right? Nova Scotia? Is that how technically, it is? Technically, it's a peninsula, but it, peninsula. It, it feels like an island. Okay. I'm on a I peninsula as well. It feels like an island as far as being secluded from the rest of the world. <laughs> I bet you it's beautiful there, though. Um, Nova Scotia is pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, you get to keep... You're stranded on a deserted island. You get to keep one item of these five, okay? Des and it's a deserted island, so the first item is a dessert. You get to take one dessert. One dessert. Um, I would take a vanilla milkshake. Well... Good choice, good choice. One tube of paint. Uh, which color? That you, yep. I, I would take, uh, I would take red paint. Why red? Uh, I feel like I could, it, maybe it could be seen from the air. <laughs> like, I feel like maybe I could. So now, trust me, all my choices are going to be how do I get off this island. Oh, really? Okay, because my next my next uh, item is one actress. Oh, oh, god, uh, Natalie Portman. 
<laughs> okay, good choice. That's my fastest answer so far. <laughs> so now you don't want to get off the island? <laughs> well, now I'm, now I'm reconsidering. <laughs> um, one band or musical act? Oh. Uh, even if they're dead, like, can they come back to life? If yeah, they I mean, come... you're on a deserted island. <laughs> it's a magical You've island. You've got Natalie Portman in a tube of red paint. So. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> but that could possibly happen. We may have been on the same plane. Like, <laughs> but if I say like, uh, like you know, Jimi Hendrix, it's like, why is he suddenly? Anyway, that's not my answer. Uh, <laughs> answer would be. By the way, by the way, Ian, if you get this, if you get this book done, I think you got a shot at Natalie Portman. Hopefully. All right. So that's, my, that's the first person I contact when the book's done. I'm like, <laughs> I don't know me. This has nothing to do with you. But on a podcast once, we basically talked about if I ever finish this book, you'll be my girlfriend. <laughs> so band or musical act, Jimi Hendrix? No? Uh, no, let's say uh, Springsteen. Oh, okay. Does he, so he brings the whole E Street band? Yeah, just as long as like I can hear "Dancing the Dark" like on constant repeat the entire time I'm there. <laughs> All right, last one. You get one tool from your garage or basement or tool shed. Oh, um, a saw. <laughs> saw. <laughs> yeah, like a hand saw. Okay. Because I could probably build something then, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Because you can use like a rock as a hammer, but it's hard to like. Get a makeshift good cutting tool. Indeed, indeed. That's been my experience. All right, Ian. Thanks for coming on the podcast. It's been great to meet you. Great to talk to you. I love talking to you about your artwork. Absolutely. Thank you so much.